John Doherty, older than this century, last of a family of four, still travels the roads of the hills of Donegal. Tinsmith, fiddler, storyteller, he moves from house to house, village to village. The past preserved, a gentleman of the road. As you know, we, we, we were travelling people, you know. My father was a travelling man, and his, his father, and, the, and his father before that, were all travelling people. That's the truth. John Doherty travelling, John Doherty playing, John Doherty working his life. A suitable subject now for a social anthropologist, Sean O'Hockey of the Irish Folklore Commission. There were a big number of families who, who used to come. There were, uh, that I remember, there were Gallagher's, there were Kelly's, there were Freels, and of course our own famous Doherty's. Now the Doherty's were, I would dare say, were the most welcome of all these travelling people who came into the area, for the simple reason that they entertained the people of the neighbourhood while they were there. And as well as that, they were always a very respectable family. There were no uh, licensed dance halls at that time, and uh, as you know, the country people, they always came together in and, and, uh, certain houses and had their big nights, their bits of a, a dance and a hooli. And uh, they, they were particularly good when these uh, travelling people came along. ...sent to see where is the hair lying. And then they do like that for a while, searching... And those days, you see, they were... They were they were country dancing, that you went to a certain town land, say, and no sooner we would be in that town land, arrived, nor the news would spread all around, or you wouldn't guess who, who has arrived, and, was, and the place where we all used to stay. Uh, Mickey Doherty and the family, and uh, they, have, they have two fiddles with them and a set of bagpipes, and so we're expecting we'll have a bit of music. Oh, where's the big night going to be? Somebody else would ask. Oh, I hear, I hear that such a man, <coughs> maybe Tommy Maloney, has given the house for a big night. And I think they're to play. Oh, it's them, so sure there'll be no other body playing but them, I know. <laughs> Good day. Good day. How's everybody here? Hi, good day, Johnny. I'm glad to see you, and you're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, a beautiful weather. It's lovely, Johnny. Well, I'm doing a bit of work today. Yeah. Uh, I'm making new stuff or repairing old stuff or anything like that that you'd need done. Well, you're very welcome, and the right Thank time, you. John. We need a milk corn job to if you couldn't mind. Very good. Very good. I'll make <coughs> that. I'll make that. I'll not be wrong doing that. And we'll have a beer cup of tea and a tune afterwards. Thanks a million, that's good. When these uh, Doherty's came along, they were great tradesmen. They were referred to uh, not uh, even as tinsmiths in, down in our part of the country. They were, they were known as white smiths, and uh, rightly so. They made all the vessels uh, being used in, in the household, and as well as that, they even made lamps. Uh, something like uh, the equivalent of our hurricane lamps that are bought today in the shops. They were able to make those in the old days. And um, for that reason, the, the, as I said, apart from their music altogether, they were very, very welcome in an area when they came, in, when they came into it. Well, then, of course, you see, my father was a, and my brothers, they were... You see, they were first-class tinsmiths. And then what they used to do then, you see, well, some of the people around the place would say, well, I wish to goodness that Mickey Doherty and the sons would come. There's the thing I have to get done. And then they would work then through in the daytime. And they would make all these orders and have them delivered and all to. And then they would knock a bit of money out of it, you know, too. Oh, very good. 
Well, then my father would have maybe a, might have a few a couple of nice ponies, he might have a few nice donkeys, and the man would come in and chat to me father, well, Mickey, what kind of a donk what kind of donkeys have you with ye? Then the finish of all would be then a big dance again somewhere else. <laughs> Once the world was tiny. Before buses came or newspapers were read, there were just the Doherty's. Oh, there was trade, yes, and a word of the outside world, the next town even, and ponies and porringers. But what mattered in the end was the music, the Doherty's passport, a people's relief. <laughs> thing that leads you into a lot of company, surely, and makes a lot of friends, I know. Yes, yes, sir. So, it happened to me one day, I was coming... The stories, too, had patterns, rhythms, choruses. They were serials, too, stretching from night to night as the teller moved from house to house, the people with him. To join the big fiddle from up from the head of the dresser, <coughs> he come up and he prepared. And I was, you know, I was only a young lad at the time, about 15 years or so. He left down the fiddle like that on the table. So see to me, did ever you hear a tune they call the girl that left behind me? <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, says I, it's a good tune, and I heard it, but indeed, says I, and well, says he, you'll not be long to hear it now, and just to run the bow like that across. Here it goes, then, says he, off it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he played, and he played, and he played, and I, I had a job to keep from laughing, you know. <laughs> the music was always of the people, by the people, but not always for the people. Once, before their flight, it was the music of the quarrelling earls of Ireland. They were patrons of the arts, supporters of their rituals and their culture, defenders of their faith. When we had the clans system here in this country of ours, when we had the O'Donnells and the O'Neills and the Maguires and so forth and so on, each family had their own tradesmen. Not alone had they their tradesmen, they, they had their storytellers, they had their poets, and, uh, and um, men of, of literature. And, uh, as I say, they had their tinsmiths and their blacksmiths too. When uh, these families were broken up, say, um, the, it started off here after the Battle of Kinsale after 1607, and the O'Donnells, as you know, and the O'Neills left most of these tradesmen went on the road and John Doherty and his family were offsprings of these, uh, of these tradesmen and good tradesmen they were. Well then, there were a class of people and you know, they were uh, too but highly sprung to begin to do, you know, very rough labour and they went in more for music and, and trade. That was, that, was, that was chiefly their occupation. And then they went on as they, as they found out that, that, it, that it was pain somehow to go from place to place and try to make all the coup out of their trade and music. Well, they went then, as I said, from, from here to there and everywhere. And that was how it was. There were people then that wouldn't, now, they wouldn't get connected in with or that with every Tom, Dick and Harry, they wouldn't get connected in with people who were, weren't tradesmen or weren't musicians. And all the things that they ever played, all the reels and jigs and hornpipes and old Irish airs that they played, I have them all. I have every one of them. Oh, dear, dear, I think I should go and rest the feet for a while. Ah, dear. Ah, I think I will. I will, surely. Ah, I remember. <coughs> 
All our members, all our whole family coming down this road here, leaving the parish of Kilcar and, and heading for Glen Colum Kill. At that time, country dancing was a, a very common thing. And of course our people were the people who played for the country dancing at that time. Well, I remember the two, the, 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 man, the Manx and the asses and carts coming down this road here, all, all of us heading for Glen Colum Kill. And I remember they played the fiddle coming down the road here that day, two of them played first and second fiddle. And when that, uh, when that, um, when that part of the music was over, Hugh Gunnar took the pipes and he played, he played a march here coming down, marching down straight for Carrick, he played, he played the drunken piper. And, you know, it was just very nice to see the, you know, at that time to see it all coming along, you see, and the bagpipes hung on the, on the, on the Manx cart in front, and the two fiddles, and, uh, then when we would come here to Teelan and Glen Colum Kill, oh, that would be a continual holiday. <coughs> that would be until we would leave again. But, um, ah, that, that was a jolly time. A jolly time, surely. It was all, I remember too, you know, the roads, there were no good roads then, like what is now. Nothing but big boulders of stones lying on the roads, and you had to try to find your way along the, along the road just as well as you could, you know, and that sort of way. And, um, then we would go into Glencorum Kill, then from Teelan, <coughs> and we would spend in there for about a month, dancing, dancing and the tradesmen working, supplying the shops with their, with their stuff, and making all sorts of, sorts of utensils for, for the country women and houses and all. Well, I remember all that now. Um, that, that now, all that whole picture has has passed away into a, some kind of a new world. They were always well dressed, and you could bring them anywhere, or, or they could, you could, in fact, they did get beds to sleep in, in any house that they ever went to. They were given a room, if there was a spare room at all in the house, they were given a room with a couple of beds, and they slept. They slept there and, and um, stayed there as long as they, as they wished. They carried, as a rule, they carried all their own equipment. <coughs> they carried their own bed clothes and um, all their, their equipment that they used for their trade. And um, they, they were very nice people indeed. And they were always liked and very welcome. And as well as that, been a travelling people in those days, uh, there was hardly any contact with the outside world. We had all things in question, what had been seen and what had been heard and all the rest of it. Um, then we would tell about some of our adventures on our travelling life, so on. So that was how, that's how we did. That was very interesting to the people, and would you believe it, that since we stopped, now since we stopped visiting the places that we used to visit, would you believe it that the people got lonely? They got lonely about it. They would like to see us once more again coming. There's one there, there's one there. How are you, John? Well, John, you're the only man I know that can play tune right. Oh, do you know what you should do? You should play me the hair and the hound. The hair and the hound? <laughs> well, indeed, I will indeed, I will indeed play you the hair and the hound and the, and the red old Irish style, the way that it was first composed. Uh, and now I'm going to play it this way for you. That there's no additions to it of any kind, only just the very way it was. But well, that's the way I want to hear it. Years ago. Well, well, John. Well, well, John. Well, well, John. Well, John. Ah, well, the hair in the hood. Well, of course, the first of it all is now the uh, huntsmen go out, they take the hounds with them on the slip, and here they beat around the bush for a while, you know, here and there and everywhere, and here the hounds get some scent for the hair. Well, now it goes out like this, and then the piece begins, the piece of music just starts the same way, and it goes like...
and waiting for the hair to raise. That night for to play, surely at, at, the, at the wee party, yeah. in honour of the newly born mm. son. But however, I was just going to say there about how that the master has asked the man of the house to go for a pint of whiskey. Mm. And now says she, Barney says she, you're going for a pint of whiskey, says she, and you know what you can do at the whiskey line. <laughs> for now, says she, don't, don't take a cork out of that bottle, says she, do you come back into the house again? Oh, did I will not, says he, don't be afraid. Not at all, says he, ah, no. Well, uh, so he went on for the pint of whiskey anyway, and it happened to be in the springtime, and the blackbird and thrush was singing beautifully. So he went down, he got the pint of whiskey, and on his way coming back, the blackbird and thrush were singing beautifully. And here the thrush began to call, Feha, Feha, Feha. Feha, which means taste it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so we listened for a while. The bird called Feha, Feha, Feha. I says, he, well, maybe then, says he, in God's name, that's better for me to taste it in honor of the poor wee young, young creature that comes to see surely. And see, I wonder in God's name, I'll just taste it. So here, he took out the pint of whiskey and he, he took a drop of it, but you know. Nice and manly. Mm -hmm. So he put it in his pocket again and he, he walked on another bit. Mm -hmm. And the thrush began to sing again, Fair ha, fair ha, fair ha. <laughs> well, says he, in God's name, sure, maybe I'm better now. Maybe I suppose it's better for to take a taste. <laughs> so here he took another taste out of it. And he took another taste out of it. And the board was still calling. Mm -hmm. And the last word the board called to him was, Feherishtia, Feherishtia, Feherishtia. That means for to, to taste it and taste it again. <laughs> <laughs> so here he put the bottle to his head and he threw over the bottle. Well, here goes to say in God's name. And he, he threw over the last of the pint. <laughs> in the 30s, the world was changing, even in Donegal, for better or for worse. Not just the patterns, but the very threads of a culture were wearing thinner and thinner. The radio had brought jazz and ragtime, and the new world rushed through the cracking fabric of an older society, swirling it round, changing values, moving standards which had stood still for 300 years. Even then, the days of the whitesmith, the tinsmith, the fiddler, the storyteller were numbered. The many roles he filled, the many parts he played were still his, but the play had changed. John became a peddler, moving around his country with a cargo of goods, and not doing badly either. I, Joe, I had a real good day, but I had, I had nothing, I had nothing back with me but the cover and straps. And I had the bulk, well, indeed, and straps and straps, I, I, I had the bulk of, I had the bulk of 25 pounds worth of stuff sold that day. And I would easily say, too, that there was 10, 10 pounds of profit. 
They were indeed, because how it was, the people that I was dealing with, they bought well from me, and the men that give me the stuff give me a sporting chance in the price of it. So there you are. So now, that's how I get along. That's how I used to get along. But now, you see, there's a lot of, th there's a lot of that, that way of life that I have now to leave to one side. You see, I'm not young enough for that anymore. So I'll, I would like still to do it, but I cannot do it. They once said to when married we should be. My love and I were going to sail on to America. It was our family that kept a lot of the, uh, kept the traditional Irish music alive in Donegal. And a good lot of the old traditional storytelling. They kept it alive on down to quite uh, a number of years ago. The moon shows through my own pins as the stars do brightly shine. I'm to will come again when all nature does combine. introduce someone who needs no introduction up here. He has been four times All-Ireland champion. Uh, he has played the violin practically all over the world. He's world famous. I would like now to call on his own native soil, none other than John Doherty of Donegal. Ladies and gentlemen, John Doherty. I once brought uh, John up to Dublin, up to Dora, uh, as far as I can recollect now, it was the year 1948. And I distinctly remember there were about 2,000 people in the mansion house in Dublin. And I knew that John's number was 16, the number that he got for the competition. And I was sitting down in the audience, and uh, the man in charge there, the MC, he was shouting for number 16, but number 16 wasn't appearing on the stage. So I had to get up and go up backstage, and there was John, as nervy as could be backstage, and I actually had to push him out on the stage. And he did go out, and really and truly, when he did get out, he played one of the best selections that I have ever heard any traditional fiddler playing since or before. In fact, uh, the adjudicator, uh, uh, and his summing up, compared him with Fitz Chrysler, and that was some achievement.
fiddle playing at dances and balls was a great, at, well, well it, it was a great boon for us at the time, you see, it was indeed. I and one or two of the brothers would play, there was a big night to be here, uh, say in Killy Beggs, and uh, then that night we would be employed then that same night to play maybe in Dunkinelli for another point at night, and so on like that. Well, that would be always as good, you know, as uh, a, a fine night's pay, you see. Oh, a grand night's pay, indeed. But then here, in the year 19... Um, now, the first of it we saw, now, the first failure we saw in that way was about 1916. Jazz and one step began to come into the country. And here, the, the, the style of music that was played for jazz then, of course, we didn't go in for that style of music very much. But still, we could, you know, we could... Uh, I'm supposing that we were playing for for a night of, uh, of uh, jazz dancing and all that, we'd make a, we, we would make a fairly good shape to play that, that, that sort of music. And then, when playing that, we wouldn't touch on anything traditional at all. No Irish traditional music at all. There's something like, uh, we have got no bananas today, or hi Johnny, ho Johnny, who do you love, and all that sort of one-step stuff, you know? And we played that, of course. And then, of course, then, here's the next thing then, that come up against us was the, uh, the dance bands and the big halls. The big, the big halls, you see, the big halls were too, they were too large and entirely for the tone of two violins. Now, the tone of two violins wouldn't be sufficiently loud to fill any large place, you know. And uh, so then we had, I had to try and uh, do other kinds of things, various kinds of things, you know. I, uh, I could do a very good bit of uh, business with me all with me two hands in the in the way of thread and repairages, doing repairs, making some new stuff for shops and for people, orders and all that. I still uphold the old tradition of the O'Doherty family all the time. I go I go to the places where my father and mother and brothers and all were acquainted and where they were all invited and people expect them to come and visit now and again, well, I go to them places all the time. I have a sort of a fad for going to them places. I, uh, something I can't help doing, I must do it. I must do it because I'm the, I'm the only surviving member now of the O'Doherty family and I uh, still lack for to go on my father's footsteps and go and visit all these places and see all these people. Or if I would stay away too long from that, then I would think that I was that there was something wrong, that there was something that that I must that I that I, that I, that I wasn't seeing right, and I have to go. Once I take that notion, then I must go. my stopping places at, uh, in Clohorn, in Glenfin. Well, they have television there, they have radio, gramophone, and every sort of entertainment, and it's very funny to say now that the old man and the old and the lady of the house and some of the rakers, as we say to the rakers that would come in at night, they would like to hear me telling these old traditional Irish stories about one thing and the other. And even when, tell no, they would get tired watching television. They would turn it off. The old man would say, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, till we get them to hear something that we would like to hear, and so on. What now, what comes on, on television, that's, I know, it's great, no doubt, but it seems to be foreign. It seems to be still foreign to these people. And they would rather have, they would rather have now a, uh, a good bit of old traditional storytelling, song and story, and a tune on the fiddle. That's, that, that seems to be dear in their heart all the time. The people lived then on the edge of the world, clinging to the tiny farms on the fresh, wet hillsides over the Atlantic. There was then, and there is now too, an independence about them, and yet an interdependence also. Out there on the edge, no man, no farm could be an island. The villages and the townlands were communes, where the labour was shared, but not the land. 
In the right seasons, they came together and sweated together over one man's turf till it was cut, then moved to another's. In the evenings, the women sewed and knitted and spun and moved from house to house too, working together in the evenings, in part for company, in part for their commune as well. Theirs was the weaving and the quilting, communal efforts round the turf fire. And when the day came when the quilt was finished, or the hay was in, or the last of the turf cut, the women would, and some still do, gather in the one house, knitting, as women do, waiting for their men. And this would be a different night, a big night, a house with a fine big kitchen. Then the men would come, and with them the musicians and the lilters, the storytellers and the dancers. Yes, nights for old men to sing, nights for young men to dance, nights for old ladies to smile or to weep quietly at others' joy, the way old ladies do. Nights for young girls to smile or weep quietly at their own joy, the way young women do. Nights for John Doherty to remember. to the night as we can, he said, because not every night we'll be together anyhow. So, uh, here. Mm. I think I'll give you this moon, not Mary. The first place I met young moon, not Mary, was at the market on Sweetster Band. Her smiling countenance was so engaging. The heart of young men she did drop on. Her killing glances bereaved my senses. All peace and comfort both night and day. And in my silent slumber, I start with wonder. Oh, moon of Mary, will you come away? <laughs> Thank you. 
There was the wee red-haired man told, told this man to never let any person lay hand on that... The little red-headed man and the fiddler who'd only one tune. The crock of gold, the gift of music thrown away by the man who wouldn't heed the gypsy's warning. Echoes of a thousand stories, a thousand childhoods. So there was a fella in the, gr in the crowd that stepped up to the, the fiddler. And, yeah, well, he says to the fiddler, now, if you're tired, I'll play a few tunes for you. So, well, good man, good man, said the fiddler, go ahead. He reached him the fiddler for getting all the warning that he got to not give the fiddle to anybody. And the fella began to play on the fiddle, and he played because he rasped away, you know. And when the wee man began to play, a the, play the fiddle again for the dance, he only had the one tune over again. He had no more. I think I might give you some wee bit of a step myself as well as I can, you know. Yeah. Ah, they know whether I can or not. Because I'm be getting a wee bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> travel for for just the sake of my own entertainment and in fact I'm entertaining myself when I go to these places and meet all these people that's that's what I'm doing and it's for the sake of that and that only that I go to these places in fact I'm not I'm not after a way of living because I have a way of living as I am I'm an old age pensioner and of course that's nearly about all I want. I'm not, I'm not just too, I'm not too just anxious for the riches of the world. The only thing I care about that, I'm just leaving that where it is. I'm leaving that where it is. <laughs> 